thanks everybody for uh, coming out to the event. Um, it's been great to work with the film co-op and I've also been working with UNB uh, over the last five weeks. Um, I'm visiting Fredericton on a Eaton scholarship so I've been presenting my film work and research um, and we had a screening last week uh, up at UNB in Davery Hall last Thursday of uh, my feature documentary Let Us Be Seen which is about grassroots feminism in Belfast. Um, and that was a really, really interesting event where we had a bit of a discussion about the issues raised in the film, um, which focuses a lot around queer and pro-choice activism at home. And there's been a lot of interesting parallels I've, I've learned about more since being here between uh, New Brunswick and Northern Ireland um, with regards to a lot of those issues. Um, so the way I'll sort of do things this evening is to have a PowerPoint presentation just for a bit more of an interesting um, thing to look at. It's mostly stills and images from um, films I've made. I'll also show a couple of a couple of clips. So uh, just hopefully, again, that makes it a bit more interesting for everyone. A trailer from the feature film I just mentioned, Let Us Be Seen. And then I'll also show a sort of in progress clip of a short film I'm making called A Lot of Solidarity, which is from footage I shot uh, last weekend on Saturday, the 9th of July at the Solidarity Rally here in Fredericton for the overturn of Roe v. Wade. Um, so that's just to give, give a sense of, um, since our theme is kind of this evening about documenting the grassroots, about sort of issues and things that I've been interested in making films about. Um, so I'm happy to have a pause for questions when I show the clip, if there's anything that springs to mind or if you'd like to put something in the chat and then maybe at the end we'll save a few minutes and have a bit more of a back and forth with uh, with questions and discussion then. So I'll quickly just uh, share my screen here as well and get started with the presentation. Um, bear with me one second, there we go. Okay, so yeah, as I said, I've sort of um, decided to focus on this idea of documenting the grassroots uh, for today's talk. Um, and the background image there is a still from that film I mentioned, Let Us Be Seen. And that's all about grassroots uh, feminism in my home city of Belfast in the north of Ireland. So as I said, I've sort of given a bit of background as to um, why I'm here in Fredericton and what I've been up to. So I'll give a little bit of a background to um, I suppose myself and, and my work. And so I describe myself as a, as a feminist filmmaker. The, the work I've been conducting uh, for the last three years, including this film, Let Us Be Seen, is, is part of a creative practice PhD at Queen's University in Belfast, uh, where I study and also work as a teaching assistant in film studies, uh, teach documentary cinema modules and have taught editing classes and practical classes like that as well. Um, so I suppose I've developed more of a focus and an interest in documentary maybe over the last five or so years uh, since I moved back to my home city of Belfast. And I was just saying this to Kat before the event. Uh, I'd lived before that over in England for six years in Bristol and Manchester. And I traveled also around Latin America. Um, an earlier documentary I made was back in 2018, and that's what this background slide is, this image. Uh, this is of a woman, Elspeth Beard. Uh, she's a family friend. That's, that's where I get my first name from. I'm named after her. And she lives over in the south of England in an amazing uh, water tower, which is a 150 foot high Victorian red brick building. Um, Elspeth is a keen motorcyclist, as you can tell from this image, as well as that she's a really renowned architect and she um, converted this water tower herself from, from scratch basically uh, with very little money uh, from the mid 1990s. And it was a real passion project. And since then, because of the work she did on that, um, she's been, you know, really developed her practice and, and, and developed loads of other really interesting projects like windmills and other things like that. Um, as, a, as an old family friend, I find it really interesting to go and visit Elspeth Beard's home and to make a kind of short documentary about her life because it's the sort of place where, you know, not only is it an incredible building, but 
in every room and in every space around the house. There's so many artifacts from Elspeth Beard's really amazing life, including her, her motorcycle journeys around the world. She keeps everything. So there's photographs, there's maps. And for me, that's, that's a sort of documentary maker's dream because there's so many interesting things to get clips of and you can really show, not tell her kind of story. So that's just a short 15 minute film that I made, as I say, a few years back. And there is a, a link um, to watch it here on Vimeo. If for those that may be interested after, I'm happy to copy and paste that into the chat. Just remind me if I forget, I'll do that after I've stopped sharing the screen. Um, yeah, so that's a kind of bit of background and maybe uh, earlier, earlier film I've made. Um, and I'd like to focus a bit about um, the making of Let Us Be Seen. So I'm not sure if anyone here attended the screening last week and please let me know or ask about it after if you did i'd love to hear from you but i'll give a bit of background to this uh this film so as i said i kind of moved back to belfast in in 2017 and at that time um that was when there was a lot of pro-choice activism going on um across the island of ireland so um down south or in the republic of ireland there was a move to repeal the eighth amendment of the Irish constitution, which was, um, which made abortion illegal. And so I remember coming back from traveling around Latin America and getting on a bus and going down to Dublin and attending those rallies. And it was really important for, for feminists in the North of Ireland as well, because that really garnered a lot of traction and made people realize that um, there was a sort of disparity between the laws in the North of Ireland and both the rest of Ireland and the UK, and they were infringements of human rights. So we also had then a Now for North movement that came off the back of the successful repeal in Ireland, which occurred um, in May 2018 was the vote. So I kind of got much more involved, I suppose, in feminist activism when I moved back home. And that is what got me thinking about the idea of getting out with a camera and documenting these scenes. Um, I think so often, a lot of the, the work that is done um, and mobilization via social media is really important, but what can happen is it's not picked up very much and it doesn't last. So something can be, um, you know, trending on Twitter one week and then forgotten about the next. And for me, having, having a physical document or, you know, a document via filming something is really important for these events as they are kind of history in the making. So the background slide again here is from, a, uh, a scene in the film Let Us Be Seen, which is from an abortion rally um, that was on the 7th of September, 2019. And that was a month before abortion was decriminalized and same-sex marriages were legalized in the North of Ireland, which occurred on the 21st of October, 2019. So we're talking very recently, but obviously it's recent history. And this is something I got increasingly um, interested in and thought was quite important to, to document, as you say. So I see that there's quite an interesting uh, maybe chasm between mainstream media and what gets represented and then grassroots work, which I think often is kind of going on behind the scenes. And um, hence the title as well of this film, um, as you may have noticed, it's a sort of rally cry. It's meant to be a, unif a unifying phrase, let us be seen. You know, the pronoun there is including the us. So it's, it's everybody and it's meant to be uniting uh, me as a filmmaker with the people on screen and hopefully then with the viewers as well who kind of can respond and feel connected to the work that's going on and how it's being showcased. So as I said, I developed this idea um, through my own feminist action and through working with people on the ground and wanting to tell those uh, stories with people and not about people um, as a form of kind of oral history. This was then part of what I developed into a proposal as a, as a PhD, as well as being an activist documentary. Um, and the why then at the top of this slide, maybe uh, I really, I did, I felt inspired when I was over in Latin America in Nicaragua um, by an International Women's Day rally I attended in a small town of Leon, um, which was a town, you know, where it was um, very difficult for LGBT plus people and very difficult for, um, you know, 
feminist issues, those those were very restricted in that part of the world. And it was very much a traditional Catholic city. And when I attended the rally, um, I found it a very sort of moving emotional experience to like march through the streets with a small group of very brave people, um, openly queer people, people wearing activist t-shirts and slogans that, you know, where it really was posing quite a risk to them to be even doing that. But they were um, so fed up with the mistreatment that they were marching through the streets. And when I joined in with that, I think it kind of, um, something sort of changed in me and I lit a fire for me to get more involved in activism back home as well, whether I knew it or not in that moment. I sort of attribute that, that time and being involved in that rally in Nicaragua to how I went on to become more involved in things back at home. Um, so I'd love to quickly share the trailer for Let Us Be Seen, so I'm not just talking about films, so you hopefully get a little sense of it as well, as many of you might not have seen it. So I'm going to just uh, unshare this presentation briefly and click into the trailer. Things that get a bad name and because they're society creates them as bad, even though actually they're a force for good. Feminism, socialism and anarchism. Okay, so <laughs> I'll come out of that and I'll come out of the presentation for a second because I, I can't see anybody when I'm um, in the PowerPoint. So um, that's, the, that's the trailer. And if anyone has any kind of thoughts or questions on that at this moment, I'd be happy to take them. Um, otherwise, if you think of something, as I say throughout, put it in the chat. Anyone want to ask anything about that specifically before I move on? Elspeth? Yeah, I have a quick question. How long from um, start to finish did it take you to complete this documentary? Um, well, I suppose even when I, when I first started filming, I didn't really know the, the sort of scale of the project. So it, it did turn into a feature film of about 80 minutes duration. Um, and the first footage I shot was probably um, some rallies in late 2018, some in early 2019. Um, but mostly what's used in the film, I think, is, is all from 2019 before the law change and then after in 2020. So I suppose all in all, considering the film wasn't finished editing and entered into festivals until March of this year, that's quite a long time span. That's maybe two and a half, three years at least. Um, and obviously there were setbacks in the production timeline with the, with the pandemic and everything else. It was very hard to to get out filming in 2020 and to, um, yeah, try and actually be in a room with people. So luckily having a small crew and uh, working around that, we were able to conduct lots of interviews, as you see from the brief the brief clips there and the, the film of people being interviewed. There was a lot of different um, people from activist, artists and sort of educational backgrounds then. But yeah, all in all, it was probably uh, close to three years production time, Kat, and I, I don't know if there's any other filmmakers in the audience or documentary filmmakers, but I think maybe depending on the subject matter, that can be 
part of par for the course because sometimes it just takes so long as well to work through and edit and another kind of fallout of the pandemic was that I really ended up doing the, the editing myself just because I think it was easier to do that than to work remotely with others is what I sort of came to the decision of and it's and it's a totally micro budget production so of course in terms of trying to save money as well um so yeah let's say close to three years all in all was the production oh thank you no problem at all um as i say feel free to comment in the chat and i will keep myself on track here and go back into the presentation quickly Okay, so we'd, we'd watch the trailer then. And then as you can see from that slide, um, this, this for, a bit of, for a bit of context, again, obviously for those uh, that may not know or haven't um, seen much about it, this, this protest here is, was on the day of decriminalization of abortion and legalization of same-sex marriages. So that was on the 21st of October, 2019. And the reason that feminist groups and pro-choice groups were protesting outside uh, our government buildings, this is Stormont Parliament buildings in Belfast. Uh, they were protesting because uh, at the time, the largest ruling political party, the DUP, had sort of tried to take their seats uh, last minute to stop this law from going through. And now it's a bit of a complicated situation, but the, as you may have seen from the trailer there, there wasn't any functioning government in the North of Ireland between 2017 and 2020. And so therefore Westminster had had a lot of pressure and lobbying from groups like Alliance for Choice, the Rainbow Project, lots of, lots of queer groups as well, lobbying for same-sex marriage. And they had a lot of pressure on them. Um, and there were Labour MPs such as Stella Creasy who kept putting the issue of abortion and same-sex marriage in Northern Ireland on the agenda uh, because our government were not functioning and nobody there was taking any action to, um, to change those two laws, which were seen as human rights infringements. So therefore what happened was uh, Westminster gave our government a deadline. They said, if you're not back up in Stormont running the government again by the 21st of October, 2019, we're gonna actually revoke almost home rule laws and step in again and we're going to decriminalize abortion and legalize same-sex marriage. So obviously that's what actually happened. But um, the, the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party, who are um, very right-wing, very conservative, and a lot of them are fundamentalist uh, Christians, so they're vehemently uh, homophobic and anti-choice. They, they wanted to make a show of being opposed to these law changes via Westminster, so they, they went and just sat in the government buildings on the day but they didn't have all the other political parties there. So it would never have actually changed anything. It was really just them showing opposition um, in a kind of theatrical way that didn't do anything. That is why the, the pro-choice groups were there, um, the feminist groups to oppose what, what the DUP were doing, basically. There were also a lot of um, anti-choice groups and yeah, church groups to protect the sanctity of marriage, as they see it, obviously homophobic groups. So they were there earlier and I arrived with the camera and then the then the feminist groups arrived and it was some much needed um, <laughs> color and enthusiasm, shall we say. So it was a very interesting day to be there filming at that rally. That's just to give a bit of context for that. I hope I'm not going on for too long there. Um, a bit more briefly about the process then of this film. As I say, I was filming at rallies, luckily prior to lockdown, including like big International Women's Day events. So right before we had our first national lockdown on the 7th of March, there was a big International Women's Day rally in 2020. Two weeks later, on the 23rd of March, we had full lockdown measures. I'm not sure if it would have been the same dates uh, over here or what the case was, but um, it made me very thankful that I'd filmed at large group gatherings because there certainly wasn't any of those for some time. And it also, obviously, as I sort of hinted at when Kat asked about the time frame, it changed how I went about the project a bit because um, I could no longer meet with people in person and I could no longer um, have interviews of sort of demonstrative day-to-day -day activities. So part of my initial vision for the film was to go into office spaces, grassroots 
spaces where people worked and to say, you know, to take me through what you're doing and to have much more kind of fluid demonstrative interview setups that were not so much talking heads. Um, again, because of the fact people weren't in offices, they're working from home, because of the fact we had to film in 2020 at a distance with our PPE on, it just meant obviously I had to use um, talking heads interviews. And it was a product of, of the time and of the pandemic to film in some ways. But I, you know, initially I kind of was a bit, um, I suppose, put out by that. But then I realized that that's, that's valuable as well. And it is a marker of what was going on. So, you know, you can't predict things with documentaries. So you just have to sort of adapt and compromise, I suppose. Um, the pool of contacts was interesting because I was working with, as you can see, if hopefully from the trailer, there's a lot of visual art. There's a lot of music um, in the film. It was people I'd worked with personally before Belfast is it's it would be bigger than Fredericton but I'd say there might be a similar thing of it's very easy to meet people and if you move in certain circles activist art circles you always know someone through someone else and they'll put you in touch um so I worked out from people I knew immediately to sort of widen the pool of contacts for interviews um in quite an organic way which is quite good I also definitely wanted to make sure I met with everybody prior to just coming in and shoving a camera in their face. Uh, part of the obviously the sort of intersectional feminist ethos of the filmmaking process was to work with people and to really not be trying to exploit or make them uncomfortable being on camera to sort of go through what the intentions were of the film with people before ever putting a camera in their face. And part of that was to also maintain a collaborative sense of um, I showed everybody in the film cuts at a rough cut stage and at different edit stages uh, just to enable them to say, I'm happy with that content of myself, go ahead. But, but there was the window of opportunity for people to also say, look, I don't like that clip of myself. Can you take that out? Which actually very fortunately didn't happen. Nobody requested any, any footage to be removed. But I think that was also hopefully in part due to the fact that we were working quite collaboratively and just being open and trying to have conversations about the, the reason behind this film, what was going on sort of thing. So yeah, that was very important to the process of the film as well. Okay, I might jump in then, um, unless there's any questions in the chat. Okay, there is one. I've managed to click into the chat whilst in my presentation. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing then, and I'm gonna answer this question and then I will talk a little bit about this other work that I've been sort of working on in New Brunswick, if that's okay. Um, so Lydia has asked, the documentary looks extremely interesting vis-a-vis -vis today's politics. Did you find it difficult politically to gather information? Did you get locked out of media in any way? Were you supported well by any particular group more than any other? Any tips on this type of topic in countries other than in America? Um, that's really interesting. Um, I think it's probably the same in lots of places. Like I know I've learned from in New Brunswick, the, the New Brunswick Media Co-op would be a kind of free and independent press that is meant to be in opposition to the Irvings and their sort of media conglomerate, if I'm right in saying that over here. So obviously I would say there's the same thing with a lot of maybe uh, press and the way certain things get reported at home. You know maybe what outlets to go to for reliable information. There's lots of good sites. There's lots of good pages I would follow on um, Twitter as well. Um, progressive Politics NI is really good. And those, those individual organizations, uh, websites and Twitter accounts are really useful. So for Alliance for Choice, for example, they would put out a lot of information and links to ongoing developments with say abortion issues in the north of Ireland and also elsewhere. So when I was sort of um, researching as part of the film and researching with people, I was always turning to those um, news sources maybe rather than again, what might be perceived as sort of mainstream media outlets. Um, and in that sense, I wasn't uh, really doing like investigative journalism. I was working with with activists and so therefore I wasn't locked out per se. I couldn't meet everybody, of course, and, I, and by no means could I talk to every single person in the scene, but um, for my own methodology of making this film. I, I just, yeah, did it like that. I'm sorry, I've got saying there's some issues with the mic. Uh, what I might do is take out my headphones.
And I hope that answered your question, Lydia. If the sound is a bit better now, I have taken out my earphones, so maybe that'll make a difference with the mic. Um, brilliant. Okay. What time are we on? Half past. Um, I'm going to go back. Um, where, oh yeah, so what I might do actually is show the clip then by way of contrast to something I've just been, you know, it's very rough and ready, including the sound is pretty rough and ready. Uh, something I just sort of started working on whilst being here um, as a marker of, of events ongoing. As I said, I attended the Solidarity for the Roe v. Wade overturn rally that happened last Saturday, July 9th, um, outside the Legislature building in Fredericton here. Um, and I wanted to go to that and to record some of the speakers and to um, get a sense of those parallels, I think, because there's really interesting and unfortunate parallels between limited access for a lot of LGBT plus and um, abortion access services here in New Brunswick. So I'm going to show a quick clip. It's of the organizer of the rally, uh, Gemma Lynn Albert speaking. Um, and again, the first bit's silent, and then there's just a clip of her chatting, and it might raise a few questions, or it's like another sort of example of, of trying to document the grassroots, which we're chatting about. So we'll just share that now. Okay. Back to start. Uh, yep, so working title for this short film, A Lot of Solidarity, um, as I say, in early stages of editing it, but here's a, here's a clip as a kind of sample for everybody. Living in New Brunswick, we know all too well the impact of barriers to abortion access and to SLGBTQIA plus healthcare. And we offer our solidarity, our rage, and our voices to Americans being affected by these developments. This is the reality that abortion activists have been experiencing again and again in New Brunswick as government after government does nothing to make abortions accessible here. Reproductive Justice New Brunswick and the Save Clinic 554 team, queer organizations like Fredericton Gender Minorities, Imprint Youth, and Field Tape Fredericton Pride, and volunteers have been doing this work and continue to do so. We are tired, but we refuse to stop. We are fed up, but we will continue to fight and protest and make ourselves heard. It's no understatement to say that the repeal of Roe v. Wade by the United States Supreme Court is a major blow to reproductive rights in the US and here. While abortion is decriminalized in Canada, barriers to accessing abortion remain. People in rural and remote communities, racialized, disabled, and low-income individuals still lack access to reproductive health care. And in New Brunswick, the Conservative government continues to refuse to fund abortions performed outside of hospital. By refusing to fund abortions outside of a hospital setting, New Brunswick is in direct violation of the Canada Health Act and has been notified of such by the federal government. Activists here have been advocating for the removal of Schedule 2 of Regulation 8420 of the Medical Services Payment Act, which limits Medicare funding for abortion to hospital settings only. Only three hospitals in the entire province provide abortions, two of which are in Moncton and one in Bathurst. And in New Brunswick, a province with more than 40 distinct cities and municipalities, abortion services are only being funded at hospitals in two cities. This is not accessibility. St. John does not have abortion access. Rural New Brunswickers do not have abortion access. Fredericton, the province's capital city where we gather today, will soon be without abortion access and those who do receive abortion services through Clinic 554 are faced with costly abortion prices um, between $700 and $850 because the government of New Brunswick refuses to cover out-of-hospital abortions. We 
hate that. Okay, I stopped sharing that. I just closed it. Um, yeah, so I will quickly go into then the sort of uh, reasons and ideas behind that. I think, um, as you can tell, maybe many of you know Jenna, but um, I found they were such an incredibly erudite speaker about all these issues and really flagged a lot of the connections and conversations I've been having with people over the last five weeks about similarities maybe between the north of Ireland and New Brunswick. Um, and I'll go quickly back into my PowerPoint here just to keep me on track of, of what I'm saying. Um, yeah, so again, this is a still from the opening shots there. Um, I really find that t talking to people about how, um, you know, even though it's decriminalised here in New Brunswick in many senses feels like a forgotten about province and there's real limited access um, that isn't in keeping with the Canada Health Act and with the rest of Canada. So even though, as, as I've been saying from the film I made, let us be seen that abortion was decriminalised in the North of Ireland in 2019, that hasn't meant that we have... Um, you know, access for everybody locally. That's in huge part due to the fact that, as I mentioned, it sort of came about through a loophole with Westminster stepping in and our own politicians and our own government did not um, legalize it. So they have no um, desire or incentive to actually put in those services. So there has still been a lot of people who are seeking abortions traveling to both England and Scotland from the north of Ireland in the last few years and that's the stage that people are at now trying to fight for those um, accesses to be in place um, and again I don't want to bombard everybody with politics but I'm happy to go into that a bit more if people if people want to hear about it um, but yes, that's the sort of, as I say, this connection I've really felt through conversations I've had here. And I, I really wanted to um, mark the horrendous um, repeal of Roe v. Wade and attend that solidarity rally and mark a moment of solidarity, therefore, between maybe the US, New Brunswick and the North of Ireland, hence, hence the idea for this film. Um, maybe that's stated in the obvious, but yeah, so in the, in the next slide, Again, I just go into that, the idea of those connections. And in the background here is, is a still of Val, Valeria Edelman, who works at Clinic uh, 554 and is an abortion care provider. And their partner uh, spoke at that event, um, Dr. Adrian. And, you know, they are both amazing activists. Maybe again, everybody knows about that here. I've been lucky enough to meet with Val a couple of times during my stay and she attended my screening of Let Us Be Seen last week and um, was asking questions afterwards and participating in the discussion in a really valuable way. And um, something that Val said at that event was that it was the art in the film that really connected with her emotionally. And this is someone who's at the coalface, uh, for want of a better phrase, day in, day out and dealing with, with um, really the difficult managerial side of things, uh, the administrative side of providing abortion care, but it's, it's, it's interesting that it's art and it's often these moments of grassroots activism and DIY art and punk music that can have an emotional response for people. And so it really meant a lot that Val commented on that. And for me, that's part of, really part of this idea of, of the importance of the grassroots and what I've been documenting is to showcase those artistic practices, how they're connected with activism, how they um, can speak to rage in the way that Jenna mentioned in that clip, you know, showcasing your rage. Um, and that can be really cathartic and that can unite people and be uh, and have solidarity as well through that. And then be also celebratory as well at other moments. Um, so again, that was how I sort of so was thinking about those ideas and connections. What, what could I write about it and what could I film about it maybe? So just showed the clip. Again, here's another still from a bit of footage I um, shot. The working title, as I said, was is a lot of solidarity. Um, it came to me obviously because of the importance of the word solidarity in all these contexts, but also it's a sort of play on words from a, from a local band 
um, from back home called And So I Watch You From Afar, hence this long acronym, Asa Waifa, people sometimes call them. And they, they had a song from 2009 called A Little Solidarity Goes a Long Way. It's kind of um, like instrumental um, math rock, I suppose. Um, and it's a really good song, one I loved when I was younger. And I guess music influences a lot of maybe other filmmakers would say the same of how I go about editing and thinking about rhythms and patterns, putting together clips. So that song kind of got me thinking and inspired to the title as well. Um, thinking a little bit more then, and then I'm happy to look at the chat and have questions and stuff and have a chat a bit more. Um, but yeah, thinking a bit more about why you would go about documenting the grassroots. Um, I guess this is just me sort of saying to people, I really think, especially nowadays, anyone can kind of make a film and, and make a documentary. And I know there's so many people who um, are very passionate about so many issues. And I think for me, um, I've made other films before and fiction films, but for me, it's been really engaging in these issues the last few years and trying to make work that showcases this intersectional feminist agenda in different forms. So as I've said, it's clear that all these um, queer and pro-choice politics are very close to my heart and that's why I've been focusing on that. Um, I have another idea for a project that I'm hoping to get, apply for funding for soon back home um, to work with, with nurses. So I'm really interested in telling those stories and a lot of the people in the film, um, you know, they're from very diverse organizations there's a group of a cleaning co-op who are amazing socialist feminists and they speak about different issues with their work. There are um, trans members of punk bands who are talking about, you know, restrictions and trying to widen the conversation between what pro-choice activism means for them. And it's been a real learning curve for me to learn from all the amazing individuals in the film and think about other avenues of issues that matter to me. So I suppose that's what I would say, that anybody could be going about documenting these kind of things. And it's maybe just thinking about your approach and what you want to, what topics you want to address. Uh, you don't need me to tell me, but obviously you can shoot stuff on, on cell phones so easily. You can edit on free software. And um, DaVinci Resolve is all free. Um, something I've taught students as well. Um, it's easy to use. And so I think it's great now that a lot of people can really get making things like that and there's I know there's great work that the film co-op here do in Fredericton with cell films and different content like that so I really do think and I would encourage if there's anybody that's um, got an issue that they want to talk about that there's just you know nothing stopping you trying to go out and get a few clips and to um, to make something so yeah absolutely I suppose that's um, the end of the presentation but we should have plenty of time for questions and chat. And again, I'm happy for me to put these contact details or for Kat to share them in the chat if people want to um, get in touch. Uh, that's my email address there, elspeth.vishfilms at gmail.com. Vish Films is my uh, production company. So social media, it's just at Vish Films NI if anyone's interested in following. And again, I can put those in the chat. So I'll stop sharing that now. And yeah, leave a bit of time for questions. If there were other things I was going to put in the chat, I'll maybe copy those in now as well. Hi. Um, I just have a bit of a question. Um, you see, when you went back home and you were getting involved in activism, was it very much with the intention of like documenting it? Or was it a case of like you were just inspired and wanted to be part of that? Just as your own like thought process, I guess. Yeah, thank you so much, Darla. It's great you've joined us from, from Belfast as well, because it's quite late for you. If you if you're at home there, I assume you might be. My, my <laughs> boyfriend is asleep beside me with your uh, good night. So um, thank you so much for making the effort to stay up. Um yeah, it's actually, that's a great question. No, I, I, it wasn't, um, I didn't go to the first event with, with a camera in hand thinking I would film it. Um, but increasingly with the Now for the North, the stuff uh, more around Belfast and the North of Ireland, I did start to think um, 
I don't really see many people filming this and I think this is quite important for people to remember so it just increasingly got as you say inspired by those events and aware that there should be some way of documenting it and yeah so went about doing that there's obviously been lots of like press at certain events and particularly that protest at up at Stormont from the 21st of October 2019. There was a lot of like BBC journalists and um, more mainstream media outlets at that with cameras. Um, but for me, it was about creating this full documentary and, and putting that together in a way um, that worked with those people on the ground and wasn't just telling their story on, on their behalf, you know, in that way that um, sometimes journalism can do. So I hope that answers your question a bit. And yeah, thanks for joining. Um, I just noticed as well that Chris has commented in the chat, uh, just saying thanks, and also that they're starting a documentary. That's fantastic. Um, Krista, would you like to tell me anything about that, or is it early stages, or what's happening? Um, well, I collaborated on a book, and actually, it's uh, it's called The Unseen Wombs of Women, and it comes out in September so the 14 women that I'm associated with now um, and connected to for forever because we have this book um, they've all agreed to do a documentary so there's two that are in England and six that are in the U.S. and two Canadian women one is in Peru and we're just on a mastermind together so we're getting to know each other and we're all trauma informed so you know we're we have internal a conflict related to our childhood so so we're all just discussing you know growth post-traumatic growth and you know why do women feel so you know like un like the unseen wounds that we have like we're, we feel caged up and why do we feel repression and all that so so we're just starting my documentary so yeah. oh that's really international then as you say gathering stories from different around the world um, yeah. how did you how did you meet was there a development process of meeting those other individuals to talk about that yeah I was on um I, I received the coaching certification so the lady that was teaching it she uh she teaches about narcissism so I have a narcissism informed trauma-informed coaching certification so I went on the mastermind with her and that was part of our mastermind was to write this book but where I'm a filmmaker and I'm a school graduate I said let's do a documentary and everybody said yes let's do it so yeah that's brilliant I think um that chimes with me with a lot of the reason for making making documentary and making films that you can connect all these stories in a very myriad and complex way that that you can't that I, I feel you can't achieve in the same way with written written responses and that does that sounds so interesting um your project, Krista. I look forward to seeing any developments. Um, stay in touch and send me a message if there, the film's available at a certain point. Sure, yeah, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Elspeth? Uh, yeah? Um, if somebody didn't make it to your screening recently, how would they be able to see your film? Um, oh yeah, Kat, so I should have probably mentioned, um, I've been told that for, for anyone that's connected to UNB for a starter locally that they will uh, be purchasing a copy of the film for the library um, and hopefully it will be there available in physical copy and online as well. Um, other than that I it's sort of doing a bit of a festival run at the minute so um, after after we see what happens with festivals I'll be putting it online as well and um, almost certainly I'll, I'll make it freely available. I don't exactly, I assume that could then be, be global, the link would work, but I don't exactly know about that yet, but it, it will be definitely available online as well, I'd hope next year. Um, and the other sort of final stage plan for the project is to do an online archive. So again, I'm just sort of figuring out how best to, to get funding for that, but I would really love to have an online resource it might contain longer form interviews um, of people that featured in the film that have, have a bit more on each person 
and it could be hopefully a bit of an educational tool for those in the future that might want to look at say oh this activist or this artist or this person from this organization and hear a bit more from them because obviously when you're editing together uh, with that many speakers in one 80 minute film you don't get to hear the full detail of what everybody has to say and so I really think using all the materials I have that are um, as yet unedited would be great to put online so there should be other ways for in future years for people to access the film but uh, initially as I say it should be purchased by UNB and then it will be online as well so uh, watch the space I'll just I'll say on I'll say on my social media when it's going online for people to view as well oh amazing thank you no problem at all question for you um out of all the films that you've done what's the most what's the film that you looking back the one that any film that you've successfully accomplished throughout your filmmaking career which one stands up the most for you and which one are you most proud of um i suppose this is the biggest project i've done to date for sure. Um, um, you know, this is the only feature film I've made, and this has probably been the most work and the most people I've worked with over the longest time. So Let Us Be Seen, I think, is, is a big one. Um, every project is like a bit of a learning curve, I suppose, though. So there's been other ones I've done that um, have taught me a few things, including making that in the water tower. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with um, just being able to work on on this kind of documentary at the minute and it's kind of changed maybe the sort of films I make I've made a few music videos and maybe more poetic stuff in the past um, which I, I still really enjoy doing as passion projects but um, I think this is the biggest one to, um, so I'll go with that as I say <laughs> to be proud of it I suppose <laughs> Awesome That's uh, I, I look forward to seeing the finished product that you've showed us with your that you showed us tonight. It, uh, I can't wait. Thanks, Brandon. Yeah, it's great. No worries. Hi, just one more question I was thinking about. Um, I I heard that you were like mentioning like queer voices and stuff like that, and I understand with Let It Be Seen. Um, I think you used L Mix as the poster for it. I was just wondering, is I know it probably sounds stupid, but is including a queer artist and filmmakers and everything part of that process? Is that something that you're really passionate about um, or like how you go about that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, or like, yeah, that was so uh, Ellie Makeham, who's the artist Ellie Makes, who, who did the poster art and is in the film as well, is a friend of mine and definitely um it was really important to me to as I say to really for the the way the film was made to be upholding this idea of intersectional feminism and not just be um saying it on paper to be trying to do it in practice part of that was very much to uh hire crew that fitted within those categories and to uh hire crew that were um female non-binary trans and people of color as much as possible that was a sort of like in some local i did a couple of shout outs on just local uh there's a media therapy page in the north of ireland i just shout out and it was just to say that that, that this is the kind of project and i'd be really keen to work with people who often maybe aren't getting as much uh, crew work or just to have that experience um and it was amazing i really uh really really uh, enjoyed doing that and would 100% try and work like that again and because I just think it it obviously meant that everybody was um passionate and knowledgeable about those issues and had their own perspective that was brought into the film as well so definitely it was a conscious decision and well noticed as well um yeah, yeah Ellie's great and yeah her artwork's fantastic yeah I've took I've took a few classes with her she's really really good so I was just wondering was it intentional but yeah that's amazing really good to hear oh, brilliant thanks yeah Kat, do you have anything else you want to wrap up with or what are you thinking? Sure. Um, Tony had a question about just what funding is available where you live. Um, in Canada, we do have a lot of, well, I mean, probably for most filmmakers, not enough funding sources, but we do have funding sources. And I'm just curious as to what's available in, in your country. Um, yeah, so we have 
different options there. It's um, it's not the best, not the worst. We have Northern Ireland Screen and they do lots of funding calls. They don't fund anything that's affiliated with educational establishments, unfortunately. So that ruled my film out immediately, even though they expressed a lot of interest in the content. But um, yeah, so that was a bit of a barrier, but I actually got funding through, there's more kind of European funding um, where other countries like the Netherlands and Germany tend to invest a lot of money in, in things like that. So I actually got one of the people that funded me was Rosa Luxemburg organization who are German and they had a London office. They, they wanted to fund work that was made in the UK and Ireland. So I applied for that, um, which was great because uh, they're like a feminist socialist group. So I think um, that was really useful. And then another group that I got funding through, which was Northern Ireland based was um, Future Screens, who fund kind of innovative new projects and they had a shout out for new creatives. So um, there are options, but yeah, again, I think people here would probably say they're not nearly enough. Um, and in, in my opinion, a lot of um, independent stuff is much harder to fund here because a lot of investment goes into big scale productions. So the likes of like Game of Thrones and stuff is all filmed in studios in Belfast and the North of Ireland. So we have huge, like massive budget dramas and films being made. Um, and people love to, which is great. People love to say it's a good boost for the economy and tourism, which it is. But I think often then uh, kind of more radical filmmakers and grassroots stuff gets a bit overlooked and certainly um, yeah, when you do get funding, it's very, very small amounts. So yeah, this was a this was a real micro budget production. I had two pockets of funding and I put like obviously quite a lot of my own money into it as well um, and was trying to pay everybody. Obviously, I wasn't getting paid and that was why my teaching work and work at the university was kind of ne necessary whilst making it. But um, there are other ways of doing things. That's just the approach I took, I suppose. But um, yeah. I hope that answers your question a bit. Oh, that's great. Um, well, I put the link, I think I might've forgotten. I put my details in the chat there. Um, I can put a link to the Vimeo of that other short film in the water tower if anyone's interested. And then as I say, my website is just fishfilms.com and there's like links to trailers and all social media and Vimeo and stuff on there as well, if anyone's interested. So I've just put all that in the chat before we go. Well, thank you very much, Elspeth. This was this was really terrific. Um, and I'm sure people, if they have questions, they can contact you. You're on Facebook. They've got your info here. And I hope we can, the film co-op can keep in touch with you too. Likewise, Kat. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been really great over the last few weeks. So meet Tony and yourself and um, be involved with the film co-op and hope I can come back to Fredericton I'm sad to to be going but um yeah thank you everybody for coming out and listening to me this evening oh thank you so um if everybody is has nothing else to add we'll end on this high note and uh Tony and I will keep in touch with Elspeth and we'll keep her in touch with you all so thank you everyone bye-bye thank you Thank you. Cheers. Take care. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you.